Hey guys, welcome to a new video. This topic of this video will be slightly out of line with what my the rest of my channel is about. Although I do do stuff with PC builds and server builds and stuff like that, I wanted to touch on the current uh, rapid fire news that's going around about the capacitor situation on the NVIDIA RTX 3080 and 3090. And although I believe that the news article that uh, Eager's Lab put out is on the right track, it's being misexplained a lot. So I thought I'd touch on that being a, uh, whoop, uh, there we go, a, uh, a board designer myself and knowing a little bit about capacitor design and su such things. So let's look into that. Now, the main news that's circulating out there, and check out Igor's Lab's article if you want to know, is that some cards are using POS caps or SP caps, is more accurate as builds already explained, and others are using MLCC caps, or multi-layer ceramic capacitors. Well, both are used a lot in the industry and have different characteristics. But in this case, I'm not really going to go into the characteristics of like a tantalum or aluminium capacity versus a ceramic capacitor, but more about the size. With a capacitor, the size of the capacitor, so how much energy it can store, directly relates to how fast it can react to power being drawn from it. So if you have a 10 microfarad capacitor versus a 100 microfarad capacitor, the 10 microfarad capacitor will react much faster to the energy draw than the 100 microfarad capacitor can. That's just kind of how capacitors work. So in typical board designs, including my own, I use SMD capacitors of like 0.1 microfarad and 10 microfarad and 22 microfarad, but I also have some beefy 1000 microfarad capacitors on there. And then you could say, but wait, can't I, can't I just put like one 2000 microfarad capacitor on there and won't that fill all the needs? Well, no, because with a capacitor, as I said, size and placement is important. You place the capacitor to provide something that's called decoupling. A capacitor is always placed as close to the power using component as possible. That when the power draw suddenly spikes, it can draw it from that capacitor instead of having to go through the PCB, through all kinds of stuff, and then ask the VRM or the power supply for that power. By that time, it's too late, the voltage starts to drop because of the higher draw, and you get something that's called a brownout situation, where the chip doesn't have enough energy to sustain its current operation, so basically, well, it fails operating. So that's what I believe is being misunderstood by the most of the tech press out there. If you have one giant 470 microfarad capacitor, or you have 10 47 microfarad capacitors on the other side, those 10 47 microfarad capacitors can react much faster than that 470 microfarad capacitor can. And that's why in designs I use 0 0.1, 10, 22, and a really big one in certain spots. So what I believe is happening, if this is actually the issue, is that if your GPU suddenly boosts up really high, it has a very high current spike. Now it needs the capacitors close to it to provide it the energy to do that and to ramp up the voltage. If it isn't there, as I said, voltage drops or sags basically because it can't deliver all the energy it needs fast enough and then you get a brownout so basically your GPU crashes real quick. So basically what I'm trying to say is 10 times 47 microfarad can react much faster than 1 times 470 microfarad as we see on most of the cards. I do not believe there is an issue with boosting above 2 gigahertz. I believe there is an issue with too fast changing clock speeds or a, basically a too aggressive boost clock. Now, as I said, I'm simplifying things here because tantalum, aluminium, uh, ceramic capacitors, etc. They only have their own characteristics, but that is basically the gist of it. Big bucket, slow to respond, but lots of power. Small bucket, fast to respond, but little power. What's then the ideal situation? Well, I've kind of already hinted to it. Um, using some big buckets, and then after that, some small buckets that are closest to the component is most often the correct 
configuration for capacitors. The small buckets or capacitors will respond very quickly, but then also get refilled pretty quickly by the big caps, which can then draw all the power from the power supply. And that's how you get the most stable power play. I wanted to quickly touch up on costs. Ceramic capacitors aren't like a very rare thing. Ceramic capacitors normally are very cheap and your whole board and all electronics is full with them. They're the cheapest type of capacitor out there and tantalum and aluminium capacitors are actually more expensive than ceramic capacitors. But ceramic capacitors normally don't scale very well up to 470 UF. The biggest you can reasonably get them is 100 UF. So it's normal to make a mix of that. Most often you see the aluminium uh, polymer capacitors, which are SMD or uh, through hole, or you have these fancy new SP caps, which are basically the same thing, but then in a different package. But about costs, even though that single 470 tantalum or aluminium capacitor is probably more expensive, since you only have to place one component instead of 10, in the end, it's probably cheaper to use one more expensive capacitor than 10 smaller and cheaper capacitors. Now, to round off, what does this mean? Well, it basically means that the current BIOSes and firmwares on the cards are boosting too aggressively and that the power facility on the card isn't able to keep up with it. And as I said, if it drops, if the voltage drops too much, you get a brownout situation and everything resets. So what I think is likely going to happen is maybe the top end cards will see a hardware revision or replacement but all the normal and lower end cards, if you can call a 3080 or 3090 a low end, will probably get a BIOS or firmware update, which tones down this aggressive boost behavior a little bit. Then the spikes become less because the total energy draw isn't the problem. The problem is the spike. So if you tamper that boost behavior slightly, the spike becomes less and the card will remain stable. And well, in the end, do you lose performance from that? Sure, it might boost up and down a little bit less aggressively. So you get like maybe a 10th of percent uh, slower boost. So in theory, that costs you performance. But in reality, I don't think it's going to matter very much and you won't even see uh, like an FPS difference or something like that. So hopefully that puts some of you at ease about how this technically, most likely, because this is, you know, speculation, is the issue. And nothing like, oh, they cheaped out and board designs and they're trying to screw us over and blah, blah, blah. I think this is a miscalculation in regards to boost behavior that's in the BIOS and firmware and caps that are used on certain cards that, well, have a less fast uh, power plane that can respond to the GPU boost behavior it's currently set at. Okay, enough about that. Uh, I think I said what I wanted to say. If you have any questions or comments, you know where to find the comments. Uh, do you need to subscribe to my channel? Well, if you like uh, LEDs and all kinds of other subjects surrounding that, and I make my custom boards, so that's why I know a little bit about capacitor design and stuff like that. Uh, feel free to subscribe. Otherwise, uh, there's not going to be too much content like this on this channel. Uh, a like is always appreciated. And uh, well, who knows, maybe I'll see you back in the next video. Bye-bye.